Good evening, everybody. A uh, very warm welcome to you uh, to another WISH uh, webinar. We're very excited to uh, host um, a very, very important guest this evening who we'll introduce shortly. For those of you that haven't been on our webinars before, WISH stands for WIT Sport and Health. It's an official university research group and it is tasked with overseeing all research academic and clinical initiatives in the field of sport and exercise medicine at WITS University. So we host this on behalf of the Faculty of Health Sciences and we welcome you all to this webinar, a packed house this evening. And that's because a well, lot to do with the, the speaker that we're hosting this evening. We've had these webinars for a couple of years now and we've been very fortunate in having excellent support from our sponsor the Asina Lita Pharmaceutical Group, and we thank them again for their input over the year. And we look forward to further collaborations next year, which we will hope, hopefully announce shortly. I also want to thank the uh, WISH Management Committee uh, under the chair of Dr. Helen Nyezwa for their support of all WISH initiatives and to the Dean and the executive of the Health Sciences Faculty, we thank you for supporting WISH through all these initiatives. Very importantly, there's some technical aspects which go into these webinars, and we couldn't do that without the assistance of um, Robin, who is uh, with us again this evening, Dr. Robin Saggers. Uh, Robin, just put your camera on for one second so everybody can see you, please. You're always hiding in the background. So there's Robin, and I'm going to ask him to keep his uh, video on. Robin, two weeks ago, was recognized by the university for the work he's put into these outstanding webinars, and he received an award, uh, especially for these webinars at the VIT Sport Award. And we're very, very proud of the work he's put in, and, and it's important that we acknowledge that. Uh, Dr. Siabunga Kunene was also uh, recognized from the Wish Manka, and so we we uh, recognize Siabonga for his work in the field as well. So thanks for all for attending. We look forward to you interacting and please do that in the Q&A facility rather than the chat facility. Put your questions there and we look forward to an engaging question and answer session at the end of this talk. But let's get on to the talk and let me proudly introduce Dr. Helen Milson, a PhD in sports physiotherapy. And in fact, her doctorate was in groins and hips, which she did through Kent University in the United Kingdom, uh, graduating last year. So that is really just one of Helen's outstanding achievements in a, in a stellar career of outstanding service to her profession. And I can say that I've known Helen for over 20 years and always knew her as a game breaker, someone who set a standard for many of her colleagues, and in fact led the way for many female clinicians in her field, in a time where it was far from fashionable for female physiotherapists to be prancing around a rugby change room. Uh, Helen led the way and has opened up many doors for her younger colleagues, and I think we all owe her a debt of gratitude for what she's done for equity in the field of sport and exercise medicine. And I will always remember her for that. But apart from that, Helen has had an outstanding career and it's a career of contribution. She's really engaged in not only clinical application of sports physiotherapy, but in a significant amount of research as well. Dating back to her master's degree in 2004, which was on stress fractures in cricket, uh, in bowlers backs, and right through to her PhD, which I mentioned last year was in hip and groin injury. Her clinical input has spanned numerous sports, South African rugby, South African hockey, South African cricket, South African surf lifesaving. And what I remember from our engagement was as her uh, service to Stormers rugby, right back from 2000 to 2005. She's been to the All Africa Games, the Maccabi Games and the Commonwealth Games, and she's currently a physiotherapist for South African Adaptive Surfing. Helen has spent a number of years overseas in the UK working and studying, as we've said, and her 
expertise has been recognized at the highest level. She's a sports physiotherapist who consults to UK insurers for the Premier League football, PSG, Bayer Leverkusen, as well as a number of elite sports and sports persons at both team and individual level. But she also has never forgotten her roots and she currently has come back to South Africa and she's engaged in community work, working at Grutuskur Hospital and in Kailicha and Langa. So we really are very, very privileged to host Helen Wilson this evening, a, a true servant, a true leader of the profession. And I have been looking forward to this talk for a long time. And I'm sure we're all going to learn a lot from someone uh, who's seen a lot and given a lot. So Helen, that's enough from me. I'm going to hand over to you and ask you to share your screen. And then we will catch up again at the end for the question and answer session. Over to you. Thank you very much for those very kind words. Um, it, for me, it's an absolute privilege to share what I've learned because I wish I'd known 10 years ago what I knew about groins and hips, what I have learned in the last six years. And working with the Premier League, I've learned so much about um, groins and hips. So my greatest joy now is sharing it with everybody. Okay, that's fantastic. Okay, because basically, uh, we, I'll, it's, it's a huge subject. I give day workshops. So to try and bring it down to an hour is difficult because there's so much I want to talk about, but it will be groin and hip complexities and rehabilitation. And just even starting that picture I put there because just look at the torsion around the pelvic and hip area. And you're gonna hear me talking about that a lot. Um, and you'll see why, but it's it's huge. And we've actually haven't taken enough notice of it over all the, the previous years. Um, I really, really, really have learned a lot. Okay, so in 2011, Bazzini um, talked about groins and hips being the Bermuda Triangle of sports medicine. And that is such a fact, um, which is why I love doing it because it's like a big jigsaw puzzle. And uh, Mosley in 2018 talked about groin pain, causes time loss for one in five players each season. And there's no question about that one. And if you look here, I just, these are some studies. I, during my PhD, it was a professional one. So I had to bring in the practical with the academic. And so I had over 2000 studies, which was probably a little bit too much, but it's evolving all the time. So these are just a few of the studies that I've put there, but look at all the different sports on the right-hand side there. And in particular, the ice hockey goalkeepers have terrible problems with groins and hips, but all those, all the different sports, so whatever any of you attendees, whatever sport you're dealing with, it is really underestimated. And uh, there's so many studies on it. And basically, Ryman, who's excellent in 2020, said there's no agreement on how to classify, define, or diagnose hip-related pain, which is a common cause of hip and groin pain. So to this day, in spite of 2,000 studies, there's still no agreement on it. But we'll work through this, and I can tell you a little bit more. Um, essentially, it's coexistence of multiple pathologies. It's very, it's very rare just to have one although it can be for sure, a lack of agreement of diagnostic criteria, and I'll explain that a bit to you still, the non-specific nature of the signs and symptoms, without a doubt, lack of specific clinical tests, we're going to go through that briefly, and there's minimal evidence for the efficacy of conservative treatment. And in spite of all that, um, there's a definite outcome, which I find very, very good. And as I said before, I wish I'd known 10 years ago what I've learned now how to deal with them. So basically, I'm going to be talking about differential diagnosis briefly, anatomy and functional anatomy. I think you'll get sick of me talking about that. Functional movement assessment. Those two are my absolute criteria for rehabilitation and prevention. And those two, I will be briefly going over test radiology and surgery, but those two highlighted will lead to rehabilitation and lead to prevention. Um, the outcome of my whole thesis is about you can prevent these things happening in the first in the first place without a doubt. So that's what I'll be running through. Before the differential diagnosis was all about 
all those different things. I won't run through them, but there were so many. And working with the Premier League, you wouldn't believe how those things were all used. And unless the doctor diagnosed one specific diagnosis and sent to that specific orthopedic surgeon who only did uh, adductors or only did groin or only did something else, um, the, the patient often went to the player, Premier League went to different orthopedic surgeons or everywhere. So it was a bit of a, a problem. And in fact, it was the doctors who pushed me into doing my, my PhD on this ultimately, because it was so difficult for them and they're fantastic, but there is no specific diagnosis as I will show you, not often. Um, I'm, I put that there because um, in 2012, I, before I even thought about doing a PhD, I wrote, a, I wrote two handbooks on knees um, on the latest evidence in the world, which was specifically for the doctors, just to try and get friends with them and get some respect from them. Uh, it was a lot of hard work, but it worked well. Then they asked me if I would do one on groin and hips, and there were um, 280 um, studies in here and 12 bullet points from specialists around the world. And that actually made them, uh, University of Kent push me into doing the PhD. But that started showing how uh, very, very difficult it all was. Oh, sorry. Um, so with that difficulty of differential diagnosis, uh, the best thing that happened was the Doha agreement in 2015. If any of you haven't read it, this is the, the cornerstone, the foundation of future management of groin and hips. And in fact, um, you can, you'll see over there, it's a ductal related groin pain, iliopsoas, inguinal related, pubic related groin pain, um, hip joint, and other causes. So that's what the Doha agreement was all about. And that's been the basis for a long time and been used quite a lot. And it's interesting because very, very recently there was a study by Hajbur who said, is it still any use five years later? And the answer is a definite yes. So that I would definitely use. The take home message in terms of differential diagnosis is Findings of multiple abnormal clinical entities tempt one to speculate that one clinical entity likely precedes other developing entities. That's particularly the case when um, they come with a chronic groin problem. Uh, it's very often more than just one thing. There's no gold standard for diagnostic definitions. So that's not the most important thing. And that's really what I've learned so much about my management of groin problems. So what do you do? Conservative management, what is the best practice? Number one, and I'll say it again and again, a thorough understanding of structural and functional anatomy. Know the risk factors, that screening, we'll go into all this in detail just now. Understand the role the hip and groin plays in a combination of movement patterns and dysfunctions. Absolutely critical that you understand the biomechanics not just of the individual, but the sport they play and the position in the sport. Identify and correct all abnormalities and maladaptation. That means the whole body, the whole kinetic chain. In fact, when a groin and hip person comes in to see me, I'll end up spending a good um, hour with them, at least an hour, because there's a lot of assessment to be done. Case functional and specific, we'll go into it. And all those four things lead to good rehabilitation and definitely prevention if you want to do that in the first place. So look at, we're gonna discuss the best practice, but look where his, his leg is, look where it is. And any of you clinicians, do you ever strengthen in that position? I'm even thinking about the cricket bowler, when he's bowling his legs up every day, or year after year, his legs in that position. Do we strengthen in that position? So what's the best practice? Anatomy, anatomy. So I want to show you the difference between a functional anatomy. Look at all these pictures. I'm not going to go into them in detail, but I've ringed around where you can see the pubic area. Just look at the different sports. Have a really good look. Because if you don't understand the sport and the position in the sport, it's very, very difficult to treat them. But look at the demands around the pelvic area. And what I've found is 
I'm quite perturbed that over all these years, Pilates and uh, core stability has been the absolute criteria. Of course, it's very, very important, but look at the, the, the stress that's going to come through. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Um, look at the, the torsion that goes through the pubic area. So it's no good just having strong core, which is critical. You've got to have be stronger below the, the all around the pubic area. So lower extremity as well. And we'll discuss that in detail. So here's Bruckner and Kahn. I, I love their books, but there it's beautifully shown where all the muscles are. And that's how we learn to do it. However, that's in reality. The other ones in theory, this is in reality. Look at rectus abdominis, the pectineus, adductor longus, adductor brevis, all attached to the pubic area and, and they, they connected, they absolutely connected. So no good having strong rectus abdominis and weak adductors. And we'll discuss that too. So let's talk about the adductor muscles. The adductor muscles are stabilizers and prime movers. Look at this guy, look where his leg is. Are we strengthening in that position? Do you know how often they spend time with their leg up in that position? Look at that. Look at the interconnectedness of all those muscles. And I found, um, I will talk about it just now, but I found I was with the Stormers for five years and um, I found that they, and subsequently all the teams I've worked with, their adductors were incredibly weak. Um, so, just look at that and see how important it is when we're talking about only core stability. It's, it's much more than that. Adductor related groin pain comprises two thirds of groin injuries. Adductor longus is injured in 90% of these cases. And that's a definite fact. I'm very, very lucky because I've been working 13 years with the Premier League. So I've got data, 20 football clubs of all these things. If I published it, I'd probably go to prison because I'm not allowed. But in actual fact, um, it's really interesting how many adductor longus tears there are. Um, so adductor longus is, is very, very common. And look at the biomechanics. So I've made, I've simplified it by putting this picture in. So look at rectus abdominis pulling superiorly, adductors pulling down. Of course, there's more around the pubic uh, area, pubic joint area. But just look at that torsion. And if we go one step further, look at that torsion around there. And I can't believe we never thought about it before, um, but it's huge torsion around that area, and it's so preventable. Um, I've got many, many, many studies. I've just put some here, but uh, what I did is the latest, 2021, the lack of rehabilitation guidelines and return to play criteria makes this clinical entity difficult to manage. That's adductors. There are so many studies. That's, I've got, I had 2000 when I finished my PhD in November, I've got another 480 sitting there. So at the moment it's the big in thing and it's fascinating. Doesn't mean it's always right uh, because your practical side is very, very important, but it's, um, there's lots of studies coming out and it's important to actually keep note of what they say and do, particularly with adductor muscles, they're very good ones. And this is an interesting one because when I started with the Stormers, I was with them in 2000 to 2005, six. And when I was with them, uh, I, I kind of devised my own uh, musculoskeletal assessment at the time. And one of the things was PNF patterns, they supine lying, they go um, flexion, adduction, and external rotation, and I resist them. And I hope they're not offended, no one's watching, but they were so weak. I even used my little pinky finger to resist them, which upset them. And they got stronger and stronger. And the bottom line is uh, the coach said to me, it's interesting that this year, since we started that, they've had no hamstring problems. Uh, the year before, there were so many hamstring problems. That was 2000. In 2016, Obi came up with this study. And what he did, he showed semitendinosus and long, uh, the long head of biceps femoris and adductor magnus, they side by side. And his whole study was saying, did you know that if you strengthen the adductors, you won't have so many hamstring problems? So I wish I'd linked up to one of the universities at the time and done a study because that's what I found, but I was very practically involved. But that's an interesting one to note, I think, um, myself. The next thing, so adductors are critical. And of course, gluteus medius and minimus. 
So Buddhist medias has got the three different parts with three different functions. And of course, they work with the glute min and tensor fascia lata. Now, I'm not going to go into detail on this study, uh, so I'm not going to read it all, but they've each got different functions, which before gluteus medius, whatever, but they've all got different functions, and glute medius is incredibly important. What has come out very strongly from Alison Grimaldi from Australia, she came out saying that glute medius is not an abductor. So when we do our abduction and clam, it's not glute med winning. Are working. It's actually a tensor fascia lata. And I actually contacted her and said, you don't know me, but I'm, I'm giving talks. I want to make sure that what you're saying is correct, which was a bit cheeky, but we've kept in touch all the time. And there's no doubt she's correct. And now the studies are proving it. But the main role of glute med is to compress the head of the femur into the socket with glute min. So glute medium men are primary hip stabilizers. That is their, their actual main, main purpose. Intensive fascia lata is a major abductor and uh, holds the pelvis horizontal during stance phase of gait. So just remember that it is, and we're going to be talking about the rehabilitation because that's also been underestimated, the importance of it. Because look what happens if the glutes aren't doing their stability job. Look at that picture. And you know what it, I want to say strongly, I work at Hurstville Hospital and I treat especially young sports injury children. And they, the majority have ACL uh, tears. And all of them, I'd say 97% have got such weak hip adductors, stabilizers, hip stabilizers. They are so weak in the hip. And now it's just become a normal thing. We will never just treat the knee without doing hip stabilizers. The next one that's been underestimated is glute maximus. Glute maximus has also got different parts, the upper and the lower, with different um, functions. And glute maximus, just think about it. How many people in the daytime are sitting in front of the computer and they're stretching glute max, which means they're structurally deformation, when, which means that when they get up, they go and they play their sport, but their glute max is not working. And if the gluten max is not working, they'll have problems, particularly with hamstring and also the lumbar spine. So glute max is critical. And what I want to say here is upper glute max abductor, lower glute max is a hip extensor. And it has a multitasking function. What's interesting, which I learned now as well, lots I learned, is that glute max does not work with jogging. Glute max does not work with walking. It only works with sprinting and climbing, which is why the baboons, the horses have got big glute max, but we haven't. Um, and glute max has been underestimated. Now I'm not gonna go into detail, but it's multitasking function. It does so much. We've got to spend more time strengthening glute max. And when I went to the first Commonwealth Games, I went with one of the girls who was the top, top, sprinter she was brilliant and the first thing I noticed which sounds funny was a big glute max on all the runners you see sprinters have got incredible glute max because that's what is so important in propelling them so check out what sport they're doing if they're sprinting and even day to day I make sure every single one of my patients strengthens their glute max the other thing anatomy the fascia the fascia, there's, we could have a whole talk on fascia, but all I want to say is look at the interconnectedness across the pelvic area. So unless you make sure the, the fascia is functioning and, and stretched, it might be massage, it might be a number of different things I'm not going to go into, but check out on the fascia because it's a very important part of that area, pelvic area. I'm not going to go into iliopsoas, but it's important and very important as well. The symphysis pubis, I don't want to go talk about it, but I can't believe we've neglected it because why do we spend so much time on knees and ankles and shoulders and so on? Look, the symphysis pubis is a joint like any other joint. And unless we straight, uh, strengthen every single muscle around it, it's not going to function. And which other joint has so much torsion going through at angles like that? So I think you've, it's so important to check out what's going on around there and every single thing we've got to strengthen. 
Another thing that I've neglected and I'm putting there, because all, these are all the things that have been like a light bulb moment for me. When we look at posture, we know that there's anterior and posterior tilt. And when we always look at that for every patient who comes in, we're looking, that's going to have an effect on the lumbar spine. But have we ever thought about the effect of a tilt on the hip joint? And studies have come out, I want to show you, 10 degree increase of anterior pelvic tilt, you get a significant loss of six to nine degrees of hip internal rotation and a loss of 10 degrees of hip flexion. Now we know that a lot of cause of uh, groin pain, hip pain, is because of loss of hip internal rotation in particular. And that's just going to be the anterior pelvic tilt. So that is so easy to remedy. And then I'm just going to go on hips. Um, if I did another PhD, I would just do hips, but mine's on the groin. So I've just plucked out the very, very common current discussion point, and that is the so-called FAI, femoroacetabular impingement. FAI, prevalent, that's what it used to be called. It's prevalent in the general population, 15%. Male athletes can be high as 75%. That's from a study. But I put that there because in the Premier League, I would say there's over, well, over 73% of the players have the, the so-called FAI, which I want to make more, more um. Uh, readable, understandable. Because in 2016, I was at the Warwick Agreement International Consens con uh, Consensus, and what they showed was what you get, and more than 73% have got pincer and CAM, and they called hip morphologies. Now, up until 2016, they were called FAI, femora acetabular impingement. They're not called that now. They are called hip morphology, they've got a pincer morphology or a cam morphology. Um, and it's only called impingement when it's syndrome, when they've got, when they're symptomatic. And in the Premier League of those 73%, very few are actually symptomatic. There are definitely those that are and land up having um, surgery and all kinds of things, but one mustn't immediately assume it's an impingement and it's serious. Um, but we'll talk about that as well. What this very, very latest July 21, uh, Paul Jukstra came out with the study to say it's related, these um, morphologies are related to normal physiological skeletal response to physical loading patterns, especially during maturation. And he says it must be distinguished from secondary CAM morphology. So he's making primary and secondary, but it can be morphology, which leads to FAIS, um, femoroacetabular impingement syndrome. But they still, they, there's so many studies on this, they're chasing it all the time. But why does, why or how does it lead to uh, hip problems? Why are they making so much uh, palaver about it in so many studies? It, because it may be a cause of labral and cartilage damage, which then can land with OA later on. So you'll see so many studies because they want to see, are we causing, especially the youngsters, to get this um, uh, morpho morpho morphological changes and that could lead to damage and lead to OA for them. So what should we do? And what's in the studies, what they say very strongly, we should start to consider activity modification for children in this stage of development. And that's that's being said more and more. So any of you in, involved in the sports where there could be morph morphological changes, we need to uh, modify the children's activities. So Igor Tuck already in 2015 was saying prevention is possible by adjusting type, duration, or frequency of loads, especially during skeletal growth. The other thing about hips, which I've plucked out, is if there's a torn labrum, Richard Villa said you, it can reduce stability of the hip joint by up to 60%. Do you know how many asymptomatic torn labrums there are? So we think it's fine, but it's not fine because we as physios or bios, we clinicians, we have to make sure that their stability is extra good. So that, that's a definite. 
The other thing is ligamentum teres um, is numerous similarities to the ACL. And without a doubt, um, in the early days, they used to, if it was torn, then they would cut it out. Now they're very, very strict about the way they operate on it and fix it properly. So anatomy, the take home message in terms of anatomy, structural, structural anatomy versus functional anatomy. I think if you know your anatomy, I promise you, I promise you, you can get most people better. The second thing is in terms of, of look, management is know the risk factors. I'm not going to go into detail, but you've got the non-modifiable risk factors. We all know that. And the modifiable, that's what we can do and we can make a difference. But I'm just going to say what's really important. Biomechanics. Biomechanics, again, I'm going back to it. Uh, and this, I'm, I'm saying it practically, but in fact, all the studies are backing me up. That's why I've got so many studies at the bottom over there. So address the biomechanical abnormalities. And the the, the, one of the latest studies said, treat, treating a single pathological and anatomical entities is limited. So it's not often one pathological entity. The other thing is load. Well, there's, there's so many studies on load, but optimal function, effective load transfer. So it's not just a case of reducing the load, but making sure everything's strong to allow that load to go through correctly. Now, screening test is interesting because Raul Barr in 2016, I've got huge respect for him, Professor Raul Barr, but he came out why screening tests to predict injury do not work and probably never will critical review and what he came up with and I was there when he gave this talk I, I went luckily I went to all the conferences around Britain and Europe for my PhD I loved it and basically he was there and he was saying targeting physical exam is uh, to detect current injury problems yes to detect future injury risk uh, injury risk he's querying it to detect future injury risk well I really I, I dispute that completely. Um, that's why I had that little guy in the corner there, because I disputed from all the experience I've had with all the different teams and doing screening. So I disputed. But luckily, um, at the bottom, there's, there's a study at the bottom of the screen in 2021 saying it's important. And this particular one that I've got over there, to exercise-based prevention programs, reduce non-contact musculoskeletal injuries, and it's got, it reduces it by 23%. So it wasn't just me being difficult. I definitely don't agree practically. Um, and there's this proof that's come out right now, which is fantastic. So to move on, that's risk factors, which is, um, and, and screening, which is very important. So assessment, I'm not going to go into detail. Um, functional tests. So I've put some pictures here. This is one of our top, top wiki keepers. Can you see the pressure on the hip joint in this position? And I want to tell you that many, this one, have had total hip replacements later on in life. Because can you imagine doing that every single day or most days, right through year after year? That's really not good for the hip. And the same thing with squash. I know one top world champion who's had total hip replacements. So watch the type of sport. What about um, cricket bowling, when you land, it's 4.6 to 6.2 times body weight. So look at that torsion around the pubic area. So functional tests make sure what sport they're playing and what exactly they're doing. And then look at the entire kinetic chain. If they come with groin prey problems, it's the entire kinetic chain. Um, I've just put a few tests. I mean, I could give one hour just on tests. At Trent Dellenberg, I really do a lot of. Lunging, of course, double leg squats tell you everything. Single leg squats tell you a lot. And this one, which we never used to do, and uh, Southampton Football Club are very, were long ago, very into groins and hips. But if you were in the audience now, I would tell you to sit with your one leg up like that and see how long you can hold it. You would not believe how people can't hold it like that. And one step further is if they get in this position, whether it's rugby or, or soccer, they get in that position, I'd make them stand with their left leg a little bit more, um, a, a little bit better, but I'd make them stand with 
in straight position, doing that kick action and see how long they can hold it. You'd be surprised how weak they are and how they battle to do it. Uh, and don't forget neuromotor control tests. Um, if you, know, you know if the glute max is not firing properly, never mind strong, or if it's not firing, then you've got more pressure on the hamstring and the lower back as well. And I've actually marked two uh, master and, and PhD students uh, trying to verify this. I'm not going to talk about the best and SEB test. There's so many studies to show how excellent they are in terms of proprioception. Um, I don't know if you know the wall test. I wish I could get somebody to study it. I use it all the time. And to me, that's a, one of the most functional tests and tell me lots of things. Um, I haven't got time to go into detail, but it's an excellent, excellent test. This is one of the South African cricketers that I treated, and you can discover a lot of problems. Um, the other one is the PNF, like I told you before, that's the pattern that I do, and it tells me a tremendous amount. The influence of fatigue, so if you do the test, make sure you do it all at the same time, and particularly I would do it after sport, after training when they're tired, because that tells you a lot. Um, in terms of objectivity, you get the Biodex, the BTE, the functional movement screen, the force platform, they're all excellent, but a while back they used to be the end thing. And they are fine as long as you're doing it in conjunction with everything else. And a good friend of colleague of mine, Grant Downey from Manchester City, he came out and said, it's overrated in isolation and it's vital to screen players. He said that long ago as well, but its interpretation is key with many other factors needed to be taken into account. So it's very good. And the players love all the fancy stuff that comes out of the machines, but that's just one part of it. Specific tests, again, I'm just going to zoom through and take out um, important stuff. Um, I've got, there's so many tests on it, but I've just taken out some of the latest ones. So they're trying all the time to come out with tests. And these are some of the very important ones. Um, I do a lot of LLD, Thomas Test, CSIGN, I find them good. In terms of Faber and Fader, there's so many studies coming on now, but what does, Sorry, that book at the bottom there is a very good book, which tells you um, the sensitivity and the specificity of these tests. But what I want to show is the C sign is very good. Thomas test I use all the time. If they, by the way, if they do the C the C sign, very often it is a hip, not always at all. But then you start having a provisional diagnosis. Thomas test is excellent. Sometimes they just stiff and that's all the problem is. I love the Thomas test. But this is where all the studies are going now because they're saying a negative fair or fader and faber test is suggested to rule out symptomatic FAI and or labeled pathology. In other words, to, to rule out hip pathology. So I think if it's negative, you mustn't rule it out. But it's if it's positive, then put that as a red flag for sure. Um, and people with, it's, it's got here, this, this study in 2020 by Kalish, he said, we would not recommend their use to confirm the diagnosis. So that's right. I think I would have a provisional diagnosis. I'd have a red flag, but you cannot use it to confirm, which a lot of people do. And they, uh, St. Pierre, in 2020 said it should be standardized. So they're working on it all the time. That's being, it's uh, very, very good. A lot of squeeze test. Squeeze test is used in all the football clubs. And it quite amuses me because I speak to them when I go and see them. I've got a good relationship with them now. It took two years to get any respect because I was a woman. I was only a physio, I was from the Southern hemisphere. So it took two years, but now they're fabulous. And I get on so well with them. And I ask them questions like, why is a squeeze test so important? Because they do it pre-season and once a week. And they said the reason they're doing it because they can see if the, the groin, the adductors are getting weaker, they're tired, or there's a potential problem. They can tell by doing it, especially the crook line one, and they can tell if there's a problem or not. And um, that's why they do it on a regular basis. But actually, when I went to... Oh, they do it after training. Well, I recommend they do it after training. So it's very good for just keeping 
an eye out for if they're going to potentially have any problems. But when I, I went and gave a talk at a Bournemouth football club, um, and the doctor, I gave them a talk on groins and hips actually quite a long time ago, and they showed me the groin bar. Now, the groin bar is now being used everywhere, and that's very much more objective and specific. So that's been used a lot, but I would still do what they were doing as well as. What well, the, the, sec the um, um, second hand squeeze test is very, very good. Thorberg's squeeze test, that's used all the time. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> the, the Thorberg, I don't know if any of you know it. I'm just going to go back to that. Sorry, that's used all the time. It's very subjective, but it's excellent and it's used all the time. And you can run on the field and use it, but you can use it wherever. And that works very, very well if you haven't got anything else. So what's the solution in terms of tests? A battery of tests. That's why I spent so long assessing a patient with groin and hips, because you've got to do all the tests and you do a battery. But it's quite exciting to find the solution. And I've just put that there. I'm not going to go into it. But I went to Aspatar, uh, Qatar, and Van Lynchhausen. He does his tests and he does it based on the Doha agreement, which was quite interesting and different. And yeah, it's, it's nice to pick up new things all the time. Now, I want to put this one caution in terms of hips. We always learn in undergraduate that you must um, maintain and, hip, and improve hip range of motion. So you lie like this, drops to the left, drops to the right. Is that correct in the sporting world? Well, these are studies. I've got all the, those down below, are all the authors. Baseball pitchers, elite female ballet dancers, gender, differences, gymnasts, indigenous versus non-indigenous, ethnic differences, tennis players. They all have different range of motion. So they have adaptive changes according to what they're actually doing and how they play and what their biomechanics are. So what's important is they come up with this to say strong evidence shows that the total hip range of motion is important. That comes up again and again, but one must look at the total hip range of motion. So you could have the same hip range of motion, but in a different category, as opposed to that, that's, that picture that I showed you. So summary and tests, functional anatomy, functional tests. I'm back to that again. Individualize. Every, you cannot press the screen and out comes a very specific uh, assessment. Every single person who comes in is very different. Know the risk factors, definitely screening as a preventative thing. Understand the role the hip and groin plays and a combination of movement patterns. Look for dysfunctions. That wall running is very good. Okay, so sorry, <laughs> I went quickly there. Radiology, I'm not going to go into in detail. All I'm going to say, it's difficult to determine the MRI grading based on standardized clinical examination tests and patient history. So the MRI is going to tell you so much, and so many of the MRIs show you things which are not pertinent to the clinical symptoms. Uh, in terms of surgical procedure, this I could tell you huge stories about dissension between Lloyd and Mushawek at one of the conferences, which was fascinating. Um, each one, they're all excellent. All of these are excellent, but they've got their very specific way of doing it. Um, and essentially, the biggest uh, problem at the moment is the use of mesh, is it good or is it not good? And they've been huge up into all the, the conferences where they pro or con or whatever. And it's interesting because uh, recently, 2020, Ali Sheen, professor who's excellent, said it's not always a case of groin pain. Very rarely does mesh need to be removed. But I went to, and watched Dr. Muschewek. She's from Germany. I watched her operation and she showed me pulling out the very infected mesh. It can become infected. So mesh at the moment is the big talking point. And uh, in terms of FAI, FAI surgery, there's no con clear consensus and no one-off recipe. They're not sure yet when or you should or shouldn't operate. Um, all these studies, there's so many evolving studies. It's excellent. I, I, I really enjoy reading them all, but there's no definitive answer at the moment. No consensus as to the ideal operating technique. So also return to a sport post-surgery 
this, I, I, I'm afraid I disagree with the study based on my practical experience. This is 2021. They say uh, those people who did not return to sport after hip, hip arthroscopy was 12%, with the majority of athletes being unable to return because of persistent hip pain. Well, I hardly know one single Premier League football player who doesn't return. So I don't agree with this, but I've put it there in case you read it somewhere and say, wow, they're not going to return. Maybe we should avoid surgery. But if surgery is a given, which it's not often, then that's not true. I'm, I'm very disappointed to see that. Uh, there's my, my emoji. Um, also, biologics, that is also um, a lot of studies showing PRP, for example, they're doing quite a bit of PRP showing that it works. But there's still a lot of 50 50 discussion about it. Half the Premier League use it and half don't. So I'm going to just hit on rehabilitation. Oh, that's so, I'm telling you so much, which I apologize for because to tell you all this in one hour is an awful lot. But why I'm saying it is because all that leads to good rehabilitation. And I'm not going to give you all the answers, but I just want to show you there are studies coming through, but not many. The latest studies are there, but there are not many studies on rehabilitation. And Adam Weir came out with there's not been much significant improvement in the studies published over the last 30 years in terms of rehabilitation. Um, I've just put that there. I'm not going to go into detail, but I like this because so often it's all about um, a recipe of what to do and what not to do. But all those are very, very important. And biopsychosocial is critical and lifestyle is critical. So functional anatomy will lead to functional assessment. I'll put those there. And you identify all the biomechanical dysfunctions of the entire kinetic chain. That, then that leads to rehabilitation. Now, what I like is Bruckner and Kahn's latest book. Uh, it's so different to the previous ones because their nine principles of rehab were all about function, which is exactly what my whole talk is about. It's all about function. So if you've got their book, just have a look at those function principles. Plus, they've also got loading, the pubic bone overload, and address other remote factors, the entire kinetic chain, the function, and what are important steps in this rehab process. Have a look. What about, this is, I've added in, it's not in their book. Activities of daily living, how often we assume that it's the sport that's causing the problem, but in actual fact, it's the activities of daily living, cross-legged and all that, like that, or they're sitting in front of the computer in terrible manners, uh, they, their knees are higher than their hips, so they're putting pressure on their hips. Watch their activities of daily living. Educate them. So design and implement strategies, the objective, make notes, and have medical legal records. I'm not going to go into detail on that, but that's quite an important part of it all. And if they go back to sport, transparent exit criteria. So groin and hips, you've got to have extra patients and they do as well, which is why I explain everything to them. I show them because once they understand, they're incredibly compliant, sports people are. And continue with the exercises for at least one year after injury symptoms. Whatever exercise you're giving them, I don't continue. It's part of their whole fitness program forever and ever. Warm up, functional flexibility. The leg swings, by the way, I cannot highlight enough how important it is for trail runners, for all the different sports people, because why? You know, we do pendular exercises for the shoulder. It's the same principle with the hip. You want to hang it out of the socket and let it swing. It makes such a difference. If people are hiking up the big mountains, they stop and do it every now and then, and they have no compression on the hip joint. It works very well. And functional flexibility, we'll go into that, as opposed to just static flexibility. Uh, I'm just going to put a couple of pictures here like that, because piriformis, you'd be surprised how most of them are very tight in the piriformis. Specific muscles, I just want to say, I did say in anatomy, so I'm going to go through quite quickly. These are the important ones that are, are neglected. And there are lots of studies to show which exercise works which muscle. So glute meat, I did say to you, and I'm just reaffirming, um, gl um, glute uh, abductors, 
and CAM exercises are not hip abductors, those tensor fascia lata. The hip height is brilliant. It works so, so well. And I do it with every single patient that walks in the door now. It's very good. Uh, glute max, the studies have shown that two that work the glute max very well is in line, the bridge line, which works a hamstring as well, and also the kettlebell thrust, that works well. So, and there's studies to show which ones work the best. Um, adductor muscles, 41% reduction in, in risk of groin problems for players performing the adductor strengthening program. So there are many studies on it. The Copenhagen hip adduction exercise, that's quite difficult, that one, but you can make it easier than that. I just want to add in, this is one of mine, and any exercises I give any players about knees or ankle, whatever it is, I always have done for the last 29 years, put a ball between the knees to, to engage the adductors to work at the same time. So I've always done that. And even uh, I've got pictures of um, Corne Kricher in the gym doing, doing um, arm exercises, upper body, and he's against the wall and he's got a ball between his knees at the same time. I'm not going to go into yoga, but if any of you are involved in yoga, um, there's a new thing that just come out now with Alison Grimaldi showing how you must just change the pose, otherwise you're putting pressure on the hip, hip joint. Neuromotor control, that's the feedback and feed forward. I've got a picture of Corne because it must be done all the time. So look at look how he's leaning. His abductors are not working properly. Every time the phone rang, traveling around the world that's new zealand they have to stand on the balance mat and stand properly and look at him there he's uh, not doing it so he's in trouble with the picture um pnf patterns that is the pattern i'm not going to go into detail but we've got to strengthen it in that position not just low like that picture on the right there but you've got to strengthen it in what they need uh, contract relax, I use so much. It works extremely well. I'm sure most of you do, but that does uh, relieve a lot of the tightness and stiffness. Return to sport. Shears return to sport is still one of the best ones that there are. And remember, it's return to um, gradual return. So part of training, full training, a little bit of uh, competition and then full competition. But what's come out now, 2021, extensive clinical and MRI examination does not assist in providing a precise estimate of a time, time to return to sport. So there's nothing that's going to tell you in the, in the scientific evidence, but you can work it out without a doubt. You must take into account psychology. That's a huge part. I find the more I tell my player and show them and they understand, the, the easier it is for them to not get worried about having to be off for a long time. Monitor the progress on an ongoing basis right through the season and monitor it during fatigue as well. So groin and hip complexities and rehabilitation, they are no longer the groin, the Bermuda Triangle of sports medicine. That's good, that's the latest coming out there. There was a study that came out re very recently it was a consensus recommendation. And they've said they've worked out definition, diagnostic criteria and classification. I'm not convinced. What they do say, a negative fader helps rule out hip disease. I hope so, but it would still be provisional. And imaging should always be done in combination with the patient's symptoms and clinical signs. That are definite. Um, so that I like that consensus, but we mustn't take it as now we know everything because we still have to work it out all the time. So groin and hip complexities and rehabilitation, differential diagnosis is complex. You have to understand the anatomy versus the functional anatomy. Can't stress that enough. Look for movement dysfunction patterns and compensatory muscle patterning. Offload the pubic joint, especially in young people. Rehabilitation. It works well if you've done all those things. Ongoing monitoring, you don't think they're fine and send them back ever with groin and hips. There is a time frame to consider surgery. I work very closely with the orthopedic surgeons or the sports physicians. I always work very, very closely with them and, we, and ongoing discussions. So knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. 
Um, and as I say, I've learned so much. I'm, I'm, I love to share it. <laughs> Individualize every single person that comes in. And so what is the solution of the complexities leading to rehabilitation? To me, the solution is simply prevention. We should stop it happening in the first place. It's so easy. If we can do musculoskeletal assessments in the beginning, we definitely can prevent. And this is a specific prehab bearing in mind the entire kinetic chain. So when we're doing it, look at what goes through the pubic joint. Look at everything around that area, including the entire kinetic chain. Right, um, now I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, Helen. I mean, as expected, a really wonderful talk. Apart from all the questions which are pouring into the Q&A, uh, I've also received a number of WhatsApps commenting on the talk and how interesting it is and um, how we'd like to get you up to Joburg to interact with our physios. So thank you. It was always expected to be a great talk and you certainly delivered. Um, can I start with a, a comment perhaps, and that is to challenge this concept as defined by the Doha consensus agreement and I was there in 2015 when these uh, concepts were being discussed in in Qatar where they, they quite clearly define the different uh, subtypes if you like of groin injury uh, the adductor the iliosolus the, the inguinal uh, etc having listened to you and talk repeatedly about the interaction of the different anatomical components does it not make more sense to go back to a more umbrella type term like sports groin, which sort of acknowledges the interaction of all these anatomical structures and doesn't dumb it down to one or two of them, and then to work your way through the potential areas that might be involved, including the whole kinetic chain? Whoa, <laughs> good question. Um... I like the Doha agreement because they are anatomically dividing them into different sections. And I like that. And I like the fact that the hip is separate. Until the Doha agreement, even Professor Per Holmes, whom I absolutely revere, the hip was often not discussed. So it was kind of blanket. And I, I wouldn't like to go back to a blanket groin. Um, I like the idea of dividing it. But that doesn't mean it's definitive, not at all. But it does. It does break it up, I think, quite um, makes it more simplistic. Okay, great. Then in terms of uh, some of the, the other questions that have come through, do you think that this focus we've had on FAI in the last while and your comments and uh, the comments of Paul uh, Dijkstra on this developmental aspect and the load on the developing hip do you think perhaps this is a concept that has evolved more recently because of the high loads that young children are being exposed to in sport? So you see youngsters playing tennis for four to five hours a day. You see children in the water polo pool for two or three hours a day. Loads that we never saw before and very often in a specialized sporting environment. Could that perhaps have something to do with what we're seeing? I think there's two things there, John. Number one is that we're now far more educated. So we, we're taking notice of everything now. So we're seeing more of everything now. Um, so yeah, we are more aware. But definitely, I agree with you because things have become so much more specialization in sport. I give talks on specialization in sport because I see what went on in soccer, uh, in football in England. And we are we, we're plucking out all the youngsters and exactly what you're saying, we're absolutely loading the youngsters because they have talent. So yes, I think we're more aware now, but number two, I think we are to blame more because we are loading them far more during their growth period. Um, and sport now is like the big thing and people are pushing them far too much. Earl Abrahams since off, uh, asked a question based I think a lot on what you talked about with the kinetic chain. And he's asking if you can maybe take it right up to the TMJ in terms of 
pathologies with hip and groin. Have you ever seen that um, from a fascial train perspective that it might actually manifest in the TMJ? Mm -hmm. um, well, he, I know Earl well, and uh, thank you for the question, Earl. Um, but I'm definitely not an expert. I do not know enough about TMJ. What I will say, which maybe is totally irrelevant, um, I want to, you know, because often the TMJ is very tight because of worries and stress. So for me, um, one of my major, major aims, I've got two aims. One is to um, relax them by informing them and making them part of the team. When they come in, I say, I'm 20%, 20 uh, you're 80%. Don't come to me to think I'm going to fix you. And then I explain why they are from that point of view. So I think that's number one. So actually, my second aim is always that any patient who walks in the door, I want them to walk out, get back to the sport and be fitter and better than they ever were because I've taught them new exercises. But without a doubt, getting back to TMJ, I don't know anything about it except for stress tightens it up. So if Earl would be the one to know, but if that causes any problems, I want to de-stress them anyway. Yeah. Back to labral injuries and dances. Uh, do you limit range of movement in dancers of a particular age, or do you know of research that suggests that limiting load and limiting range of motion might help from a preventative point of view? Very good question. Um, if I had to do anything now, if I had more time, I would join ballet and I would do more studies on dancing because I think dancing and gymnastics are outrageous for the, for the hips, really, really bad. There are not enough studies on dancing, definitely not. They're doing more and more. Those range of motions are, without a doubt, not good for the hip joint. You know, I've, I, I'm fascinated by a ballet because they aren't good. So what is our solution? Definitely not to load them, especially in the growing period. And number two, get those legs strong in those positions. I've been testing some of the dancers and when they're in those positions with their legs right up, they're not strong at all. So the least we can do, we can't stop the fact that it's not good, that the, the, the joint is totally messed around, but we can protect it to a degree by making it strong. Good answer. Have you found the Holmic protocol effective in patients with more adductor-related groin pain? Is that something you use? The Holmish pr protocol? Yes. Yes. Which one, is, which one is that? Which one is that? Well, specifically focusing on adductor strengthening. Well, yes, definitely. I think um, adductor strengthening is, is critical. Um, but again, again, it's strengthening it in specific ranges. What range do they need it to be strong? So those pictures I started out with in the beginning, look where their adductors are. Adductors are stabilizers and prime movers. Where are they? Are we strength? We never strengthen them like that. I didn't either. I was looking after top teams and I didn't. I'm looking back on it. And we have to strengthen them like that. So yes, all the uh, whole mesh, all those, those adductor strengthening are important. But when that patient walks in the door, I want to know exactly what they do in the daytime. Definitely, because that'll affect the hips. And then what sport, what position in the sport are they playing? And what effect does it have on the pubic area? And what should I be straight? How should I strengthen it? So I think, I think in summary, you're saying adapt and customize those exercises to your athlete. Is that correct? 100%. 100%. And there are, there are a couple of questions along that line, which I will combine. People asking so many different sports that you showed a few examples on one slide. So complex, so many different rotational forces through that center of gravity. How do you as a therapist identify in a particular athlete how to approach that particular injury uh, and customize your approach to their particular sport? I, I would presume it takes a degree of studying and homework and discussion with athletes and coaches, etc. It's, it's probably quite an involved process. It's not a cookie cutter approach. Not at all. That is, you're 100% right. And in fact, I can't tell you how many people when I give talks everywhere, they all say, oh, they want to do the Premier League, they want to do rugby, they want to do that. They don't understand those early days, what I used to do, 
I'm not saying everybody should do it, but I can only say where I came from. I used to go, I remember Brett Schultz, the cricketer coming in bowling. And I didn't know much about it. And I went on a Saturday afternoon, I watched the bowling, I made notes of the bowling and so on. Um, kayaking, what do I know? I went to three world champs with a surf life saving. So what did I do? I went on to a surf ski and I learned to surf ski. That's to this day, I'm still kayaking because I went to learn how they did it. What caused the problem? So I must admit, I spent a lot of time going there and taking notes because I don't think the academic can teach you that practicality. So marry the two by all means. But if you, I, I don't know how, if you really want to, yes, you can study it. You can actually study it on online. You can watch them online. It's probably a lot easier than going there. And probably nowadays you can watch anything. But I think you've got to familiarize yourself with that sport and that position. So what I would do now, probably then it was crazy because I gave up so much of my time. But now I would definitely analyze everything online. Is that particular great, great, great advice. Getting back to hips, a uh, question about surgery. Do you think you think we're operating a little bit too soon, bearing in mind what you've said, there's, there's a lot of options we could be exploring with FAI and so-called abnormal morphology? <laughs> that was the case. And um, going to some of the, the conferences in England, that's why I say there was a bit of a war on, which was very unusual because the English people are very polite. And it was, it was very interesting. <laughs> they are, I was quite fascinated coming from South Africa. But there was, there was quite a war on um, and, and they were operating too quickly and too much. And that's why um, the morphologies and the FAIS is very, very much being checked all the time now and, and studies are coming out to stop all the operating. So it's very much better than it used to be. Um, so no, there's, there's very little, but I can give you an example. I went to a conference, but it was when I first arrived overseas, it was probably about 10 years ago, but I went to a conference and I knew that some of the players had a label tear, asymptomatic, and it was, it was you know, being looked after or being um, operated on, or the FAIS, or FAI, or it was then just the morphology. And I put up my hand and asked the question. They didn't know who I was or who I was working with. And I put up my hand and asked the question, if there's a labeled tear which is asymptomatic, would you operate on it? And we had Mark Philippon, one of the top guys in America. We had top people, uh, Mr. Griffin, the, the top people. And I asked the question and I was absolutely lambasted for asking such a stupid question. Um, so I was taken aback. And then Mark Philippon got up and he said, I hate to tell all of you people, but in America, if we don't operate it on it, and then during the off season, then during the season, if it becomes symptomatic, we can be sued. And it caused a huge furor. And I saw Mark Philippon um, about two years later, and I went up to him and said, are you still doing it? He said, I'm not talking about it anymore. So I think it became quite um, a thing. So nowadays, they're not operating nearly as much as they used to, without a doubt. Great. There's a question on uh, differences between disabilities and adapted sports participation and non-adaptive, and the differences in hip pathology, strain, and injury. Have you looked at that in terms of screening for adaptive sports participation? Um, well, I'm very involved in parasurfing. Adaptive Surfing South Africa, I've been with, with them for five years. And these are people who are, okay, blind, but they can be hemiplegia, paraplegia, quadriplegia, and they're surfing. And I've been with them to the world champs. I'm meant to be going in December now. And every year there's the South African champs um, as well. And before the championships, I always uh, get together with them and give them exercise and assess them. But actually... To tell you the truth, I'm also their classifier, so I've got to classify them. But I'm actually telling them that I think I should pull out now because they need a neurological physiotherapist because I'm not equipped to give the exact, let's talk of hip and groins. Um, how much is too much? How bad is a cerebral palsy um, or a hemiplegia hip? 
So to answer that question, I don't know enough. I've been with them for five years and I've told them they must get a neurological physiotherapist who's much more au fait with that. Not that it's going to change what they do because they just bind their legs onto the surfboard and so on. Okay. I don't great. know if that answers the question. Yeah. And then David Milner has got a very interesting question about developmental changes in the hip as a result of sitting at a young age. Uh, and he's noticed, he works at, at football in a, at a number of levels, differences between children that grew up in rural schools and never sat cross-legged and others who grew up in more urban schools and sat cross-legged. Do you know of a difference there? And is there a reason to institute change to get that range of motion that you were talking about? 100%. That's an excellent question. And there aren't enough studies on that. But it's really, really, he's 100% right. We have to get in the schools and get them not only sitting, not sitting badly, um, because also if your knees are higher than your hips, you're putting impingement onto the hip joint. So proper seating arrangements and not sitting for too long. And um, that, that's very important. And having said that, I went to another conference in London and we had a keynote speaker from America. And he told, it was mostly doctors. And he said, did you know that young boys of 13 in America are getting osteoporosis? And why, to answer that question, because they're sitting all the time. They're sitting in front of the computers there. They're sitting at home. They're sitting at playtime. Instead of kicking the ball around, they're sitting in front of computers. So not only are the hip joint suffering from bad posture as children, but also their bones, the, not the people in the rural areas who are running around playing soccer and stuff, but the first world country people are really having a problem now. Mm. I think we've got two more questions we'll end with. Is there a correlation between knee valgus and adductor weakness, either in your experience or in studies that you've looked at? Knee valgus and adductor weakness. Now, knee, knee valgus um, is very, very common with weak, ab, not abductors, a hip, uh, glute, knee and glute men. Hip so stabilized. it's not, not related to the adductors, it's related to glute medium. And so your hip's not stable, so you drop into, into a virus. So that's very, very common. Yeah. And then so a final fact, question uh, related to what you were talking about, about weakness in sportsmen in, in different ranges of movement. A question as to why if sports persons spend a lot of game time in a particular range of motion, why don't they automatically strengthen those muscles in that range? Do they need specific exercises to strengthen them through those unusual ranges? No, they're not doing specific exercises. And there's a, a doctor at one of the clubs, I won't say who, who used to be a doctor in Ireland um, with a, a rugby, Ireland rugby. And I got to know him very well because Gert Smal, our coach, was with in, in Ireland as well. And he and I talked a lot about it and how they weren't, they, then in the different sports, they're not strengthening in those ranges. Um, and I think we as clinicians, I th like I'm treating a lot of, at the moment, some, some South, a whole lot of South African lady rugby players. And the first thing I did was offer my, to go there and show them some exercises because they're not doing it right. And I think part of my, my job description is to share with those coaches and they're hungry they're hungry for knowledge so if it's not done at that level of premier league can you imagine all the way down and how we can make an impact by doing it great i think uh, an excellent answer to end off with lots of comments coming in the chat thanking you for the most informative talk and having had a big impact and influence on the way people are going to carry on practicing and assessing uh, groin and hips. Uh, I think you've made a real clinical impact here. So thank you very much, Helen. Uh, we look forward to hopefully hosting you again uh, and uh, sharing your knowledge, which is, which is really immense. We do appreciate your time in preparing this talk and in sharing that with us this evening. So thanks very much and uh, have a good evening. Thank you for inviting me and for allowing me to share it. I'm just sorry there was almost too much information. <laughs> no, not at all. It's a, it's a complex topic, which you, you handled very well. So thank you. Thank you, everybody, for attending. 
Um, if you did log on and when you log off here, you will be noted as an attendee and you'll be receiving your CBD certificates from our WISH uh, administrator, Nadine Peterson. Uh, Robin is going to put up a slide to promote the next WISH talk, which is a collaborative talk with the Johannesburg Sports Orthopedic uh, Institute and the Center for Sports Medicine. It's going to be on pediatric issues in sport and exercise medicine. So join us for that on the 3rd of November. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you there. And thank you again for attending. Have a good evening.